Welcome back to Game Dev Chats. This is Ross, and today's topic is creating AAA production pipelines for indie teams. So what does AAA mean? Well, AAA is high budget, high expectations. These are typically very large teams. If you're working in the mobile space like me, you might be looking at 15 plus people for a 2D game with a budget two and a half to three million and above. If you're doing a 3D game in that same space, you could be looking at teams as large as 60 to 80 people and budgets over 25 million and up. What's a production pipeline? Production pipeline is taking an asset from its concept phase all the way to game integration. And what's an indie team? Well, this is largely debated, but for the purpose of this video, let's define an indie team as small, self-funded, and low budget. So how can any team compete with a AAA game team? Well, leverage your small teams to optimize communication and make faster decisions. Build 2D games. Not only are they cheaper to make, but they look timeless and they have a much smaller file size footprint. And number three, leverage technology in creative ways to overcome production pipeline challenges. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. This is Summoner's Fate, a mobile game being developed by my indie team at D20 Studios. Using traditional development pipeline, this game might cost three million or more to develop. My team is aiming to accomplish this in a budget of under $50,000. All the art that you see here is generated from vector graphics that will scale to match the DPI, screen resolution, and orientation of the device. The majority of the gameplay also runs at 60 frames per second on a single texture atlas using one draw call. So how are we doing this? Our game is being developed with Adobe Air cross-platform runtime. When others were saying that Flash is dead, we looked past the headlines and explored what a handful of exceptionally talented people were doing and saw an opportunity for how their work could be leveraged to build an incredible production pipeline. These individuals are Daniel Spurl, the creator of Starling, an open source rendering engine for AS3 that leverages the GPU for exceptionally fast performance. Gil Amran, co-founder and developer at XTD Studios that created an open source framework called DMT that enables the creation of dynamic texture atlases from vector graphics. Shen Wang Leo, lead engineer at Igret Software that created Dragon Bones, an open source platform and free to use animation development tool that enables the creation of 2D armatures. By combining these open source technologies, we've created a cost effective and highly efficient production pipeline. Now let's take you through the pipeline process of creating a character from start to finish. So the very first thing we did was create these character templates using Adobe Animate. And these were designed to help the animator create armature-based animations in Dragon Bones using a consistent form that the artist could then paint to. So if I go into one of these guys here, this is the female skeletal armature. Um, note the very few number of pieces needed to actually construct the model. And we can go in here and see that each of the pieces has a sub component to it, represent a different body part. I can click on one of these pieces and inside it contains a guide showing the outline of where assets should be drawn as well as an asset itself, which is currently the placeholder asset. So what an artist would do is go in here, delete that, and then begin drawing their happy face note how this reflects automatically um, inside the clip here and that's due to the nested movie clip capabilities of animate i'm not a very good artist but we'll just kind of draw to show you a little happy face here there's a and there's our wonderful amazing character ready to go so what would then happen is that our animator takes these pieces exports them and then uses a tool called dragon bones pro and this is what this looks like here. You have the ability to create an armature-based skeleton. If you're familiar with 3D-based model animation, the process is identical, except we're doing this in the 2D space. And so we've got the character rigged here with various bones representing his joints. These can all be controlled and moved, kind of like a, a rag doll, if you will, connected through um, these bones. And then in here, we can look at some of the animations that my animators created. And by no means am I a manner, but I'll just go ahead and play some examples. Here's a walk loop. Um, here's one of the uh, characters charging forward. Okay, and so you have a number of different animations that are created in here. The next step in our pipeline 
is to send our template and instructions to our outsource art team. We use Google Docs to communicate with our artist. Here's an example of one of our character listings in our priority sheet. Um, this one's been completed, but we'll go ahead and take you through the process. So this is a druid female. It's a female Latina wearing leaf wrapped armor clothing and a green cape, wields a tree bash fashioned into a staff and a gnarled dagger. Typically, we also supply some concept art, um, inspirational images found off the web. So here's an example of what that might look like. Um, just to showcase some of the elements we would like to see in that character. This leaf wrapped armor was pretty cool. We like these roots and twigs kind of showing in there. I uh, thought this hairstyle would be kind of neat for this character. Then what will happen is that the artist will come back and do a sketch. It'll look something like this. Our in-house artist slash animator will give feedback and notes on that. And then uh, once the artists have been all approved, they will come back and send it in the form of that character template I showed earlier. So here's the character template that we reviewed before. And this was a female character. So when that's populated, it looks something like this. And so you can see the nice detail on the character face and how the character would look actually rendered in game all put together. A larger version of this would look something like this guy that has many characters on it. And these are all instance labeled so that we can access, have a reference to be able to access them inside the game engine. So we'll simply publish this, creates a large sheet like that. Now what's really amazing about using the vector graphics is what these file sizes look like. So that sheet contains 30 characters and has a total file size of only 765 kilobytes. Pretty awesome. The weapons that the character wields are done in a similar fashion. We have a template for the weapons that looks like this, using guidelines and sizes to distinguish where the characters will be aligned on the animation. When you dig into one of these things, let's find her gnarled staff, zoom in on that. And you can see there's a little guide here that represents where the staff is actually held in the context of the animation. And so that's how the art's created. The next step is integration. For that, we're going to use our custom built D20 definitions editor. We'll go ahead and launch that. And what this is, is a tool we've built to help us manage all of the definitions for the game objects. This includes things like the maps, the characters, the cards, even the game logic, you name it. But since today we're focused on the character pipeline, we're going to go to the units and we're going to select new to create a new unit character. And so now we're going to go ahead and build the Druid as a game object. I'll give her the name Druid, real fancy there. And then we're going to turn our attention over here to the character builder portion. And here is where we're going to define all the parts that make the Druid the Druid character. And so this tool has two inputs. The first is the JSON file that's generated from Dragon Bones Pro. And the second is the Swift files that are generated from those templates that we showed just a minute ago. So first thing I need to do is select an armature. So this list of possible armatures is selected from, generated from that JSON file. We're gonna pick humanoid female. What we're gonna do next is populate the skin so we can actually see her. Right now we just have that shadow there. I'm gonna go ahead and pick the head. And this list is populated from those instance labels on that file. We're gonna pick Druid and uh, there she is. She's already starting to do a little idle animation there, looking around. And then I'll pick her body as the druid. And then we said we were going to give her some weapons, right? So it was a gnarled staff, I believe. And so we want staff gnarled. Okay. And then we're going to give her a gnarled dagger. So dagger gnarled. And there we go. So now we can go ahead and define things like her default animations that she'll use when, she, when she's in the game. So we'll give her just regular idle, which is just sort of this sort of breathing, looking around. We'll give her a move animation. I can actually see her walking there. And then we'll give her an attack. And I think for her, since she's got two weapons, we want to do something like, oh, double, double strike attack, I think would be cool. Before we play this though, let's give her some audio. So we'll select the swing large weapon. I'll add some other parameters here off of memory. So there's wood is her weapon type. Hit type is, she's got flesh. So that'll just configure the audio to work as well. 
And then we can go ahead and test that. Very nice. Get the little swing in there. And then we'll give her a cast for when she uses her spells. And so there's her cast animation, which is pretty cool. And then uh, these other drop downs and list over here are the list of all the animations that are available to us. We can also test out different parts of the armature individually. So, for example, we want to have her head look up at us. You know, hey, hi, Druid. Pretty cool. And then uh, we can also test different animations. So here's that charge I showed inside the Dragon Bones editor earlier. We've got all kinds of different things that you can see in here. Her poor, oh, poor Druid died. No. <laughs> So all kinds of fun things you can test inside of here, um, different animations that are available. And this is a cool way to see um, the different pieces of the game come together in a very nice and integrated way. One of the great advantages here is that there's, there's absolutely, absolutely no coding necessary to now tie these pieces together, and this is fully ready for game integration. So uh, just a couple other steps we're going to do. Uh, we're going to give her some attributes here so that she's got some basic stats. So life um, is how much hit points she'll have. We'll just say she's got 20. And then uh, we'll give her an attack value as well so she can deal some damage to her enemies. And these will have default values as well that'll give her some basic stats so that she'll still work even if you don't define them. But I'm just going to show off some of the other cool things you can do here. If we want to give her any special triggered abilities or other customized traits or actions, those can all be defined here as well. But for now, we're going to go ahead and save this new character. And so now she shows up shows up in our list here. And... Uh, all we have to do now is uh, close out of this tool. The output for that file is a DB file. So this is a simple SQLite database. We're going to copy that. And we're going to go into the uh, source folder for the game. And then I'm going to go ahead and paste that into the source folder. OK. And now we are ready to actually test her in game. So I'm going to go ahead and recompile the game engine now to run. Okay, so with the game launch now, we're going to go into our configuration and we're going to go ahead and just make sure that we can see our new Druid. So now that she's in the definitions file, we should be able to select her from this drop down here. Druid, there she is. And then we can go back and start a new game. Through the clearing of the trees, the path is just ahead, but a band of monsters is in your wake. All right, and there she is in the game. So you can see she's looking up at you, ready for orders. We can go ahead and move her around. We can see things like her cast loop, which has got her staff raised, and that cast animation we defined earlier. Pretty cool. If we had an enemy up here, we could uh, come in there and duffer <laughs> with the staff. Pretty cool. So that's a cool example of how all these different parts of the pipeline tie together um, from concept to animation to getting the character all artistically created and then defined as an actual game object and finally seeing her behaving in the game engine. One thing I'd like to showcase, we had mentioned before that uh, the advantage of this running in the Starling engine is that we've got this exceptional frame rate and performance. So here we can see the uh, frames per second running right around 60 on average. And we've got that one draw call, as I mentioned, which is an exceptional feat for um, tech, especially in a mobile game. So uh, what I'd like to show now is how the DMT portion of this works in the background. So I mentioned that all of these textures that you see are created off a dynamic atlas that's using just the portions that are needed for this particular game instance. So we're going to go ahead and look at that next. Go to my finder file here. I want to navigate to where the output of this is stored in the game cache. A shortcut here. So there's actually uh, two atlases. Uh, the way I've done this is I've got an on-screen render, which is pretty much all the pieces that are persistent on screen. And there's an off-screen renderer where some additional draw calls might come into play for things like the your turn has started prompt. That doesn't need to be on display all the time. But if I go into this guy here and take a look, you can see that uh, there's one atlas. Um, this is, I think, a 4K by 1K. All of this is adjustable based on the size of and, and DPI constraints of the device you're on. So you can see here all the different parts. I can probably zoom in here um, of the different characters that are displayed here. So here's our trees, the heads, all those parts of the character are separate pieces. Um, so rather than having to do a traditional frame by frame animation, this is all completely decoupled 
for um, maximum file efficiency and, and runtime performance. The creation of Summoner's Fate is driving the creation of this pipeline. Once we've completed the game, we're excited to make this open source and available to other developers. If you like this video, please be sure to subscribe to our channel, comment, and share with other developers. Thanks for watching.